Well, hi everyone, and thank you so much for joining us today for our specialty webinar all about how you can help your patients manage depression, anxiety, and fear of recurrence after cancer treatment. A mental health problem or illness can occur at any stage of the cancer continuum from screening and diagnosis through treatment and survivorship. Arguably, we don't spend as much time on how we can support patients as they adjust to life after cancer treatment. And that is why we are focusing on follow-up care today. So thank you so much for joining us for today's presentation. A few things you should know before we begin. We are recording this presentation and we'll make it available after to everyone who registered. We will take your questions at the end, so please use the Q&A feature on the screen to post your questions. And as your hosts, we're doing everything we can to ensure your safety. If safety is breached, we will end the session and follow up with you by email. Now, before we get into the content of today's presentation, we wish to acknowledge that we are joining in this virtual session on the traditional territories of Indigenous peoples of Turtle Island. To recognize the land is an expression of gratitude and appreciation to those whose territory we reside on. And a way of honoring the Indigenous people who have been living and working on this land since time immemorial. It is important to understand the long-standing history that has brought us to reside on the land and to understand our place within that history. Land acknowledgements do not exist in a past tense or historical context. Colonialism is a current ongoing process and we need to build our mindfulness of our present participation. Connection to the land, to nature is an important part of healing. And in the context of today's webinar, we invite you to consider the land where you are situated and the role traditional healing practices can play in providing after cancer care to indigenous survivors and their families. My name is Anna Pishkevich, and I'm a stakeholder engagement and communication specialist for the Bounce Back program. Bounce Back is one of the core services that is available as part of the provincial government's Ontario Structured Psychotherapy Program. I'd like to welcome and introduce you to our prestigious panel of guest speakers today. Firstly, I'm joined by Dr. Helen Chaju Georges, who is the Clinical Director of Training and Operations for the Ontario Structured Psychotherapy Program based at the Canadian Mental Health Association, York Region and South Simcoe, or CMHA for short. She is also a clinical and forensic psychologist. Prior to joining CMHA, she worked as the clinical lead of outpatient, of adult outpatient mental health services at Markham Stovall Hospital and as a forensic psychologist at Waypoint Centre and the Royal Ottawa. Dr. Chaju Georges also maintains a small private practice as a forensic consultant. Today, she will be providing us with an overview of the Bounce Back program. Next, we are joined by Dr. Carol Townsley. She is a physician and the medical director for the After Cancer Treatment Transition Clinic at Women's College Hospital, where she oversees care of all patients referring to the clinic. She provides medical management of long and persistent effects from cancer, coordinates ongoing therapy and surveillance tests according to current guidelines, and communicates to the patient's primary care physician regarding the cancer survivorship plan and guidelines for follow-up care. Dr. Townsley will share with us an exciting new research study that was recently conducted by Women's College Hospital on the Bounce Back program. Welcome. Next, we have Dr. Alexandra Ginty. Dr. Ginty brings to us her experience as a community family physician of 30 years and as a bilateral breast cancer survivor herself. She has worked at Cancer Care Ontario for nine years as regional primary care lead, first in survivorship and now in screening. She assists in the operating room regularly in breast reconstruction after cancer, where it's a chance for her to make a positive difference for women and their confidence. Her work with the Canadian Partnership Against Cancer has been in mental health and back to work, two areas where she saw gaps in her own cancer journey. As an advocate for cancer patients and after cancer care, Dr. Gindil will be sharing some tools and coaching tips on behalf of the Canadian Partnership Against Cancer, tools that you can use to have a meaningful dialogue with your patients. And we have Joanne Stewart, who is the Director of St Strategic Development at the Canadian Cancer Society. Joanne has extensive experience in the development and oversight of programs that support people living with cancer and their caregivers. She has dedicated her career to ensuring those in underserved communities have access to the information and support they require. She is currently leading the organization's national referral pathway plan with the goal of creating efficient and effective referral processes with healthcare providers across the country. Today, you will hear from Joanne on how you can improve navigation to information and support for cancer patients. So the purpose of today's webinar is to share information on some of the challenges cancer survivors face when it comes to their mental and physical health. 
and how you can create strong relationships with them by increasing your understanding of their concerns as they transition from treatment into your care. We'll also share resources to help you support your patients throughout their recovery journey. So first, we'll share a quick overview of the Bounce Back program, including a story of a client who, with a chronic condition who participated in Bounce Back and how they found it useful. Next, we'll review a research study that was recently published in support of care and cancer. The study was conducted by Women's College Hospital on depression, anxiety, and peer recurrence among cancer survivors who participated in Bounce Back. Next, we'll review tools and coaching tips from the Canadian Partnership Against Cancer, and in particular, how you can support adolescent and young adult cancer survivors. And finally, to improve their cancer experience and quality of life, you'll learn how you can provide your patients with information and refer them to support. So let's begin with a quick poll. What do you think is the leading cause of death in Canada? So I invite you to take your pick. So you might be interested to know that um, if you answered cancer, you are correct. Cancer is the leading cause of death in Canada and is responsible for 28.2% of all deaths. If you compare this to other causes of death, um, heart disease accounts for nearly 20% and other conditions account for a total of nearly 30% of all deaths. So this is including diabetes, which makes up about 2.4% and accidents that make up nearly five. What else do the stats tell us about cancer in Canada? Well, according to a new study published in the Canadian Medical Association Journal in the spring of this year, an estimated two in five Canadians are expected to develop cancer in their lifetime. That means 43% of all people in the country are expected to receive a cancer diagnosis in their lifetime. And this translates to an estimated 233,900 Canadians will be diagnosed with cancer in Canada this year alone. About one in four Canadians is expected to die from cancer. We expect lung cancer to be the most commonly diagnosed cancer this year. The most commonly diagnosed cancer in females is breast cancer and prostate cancer in males. Cancer is a disease that mostly affects Canadians aged 50 and older, but it can occur at any age. And although overall cancer rates in Canada are actually declining, the number of cancer cases diagnosed each year is increasing because of the growing and aging population. So what does this all mean to us? Well, this means the number of people living with cancer or transitioning from cancer treatment to care delivered by primary and community care providers is increasing. And with that, there'll be an increase in individuals, including their families and caregivers, who are in need of additional support services, such as mental health support. So with that, I'll pass it over to Dr. Helen Chedja georges who will introduce you to one of those supports, the Bounce Back Program. Thank you, Anna, and hello, everyone. Um, before I get into the details of the Bounce Back program and how it works, I'd like to give you a little bit of a background of uh, how it came to be in Ontario. So the Bounce Back program was initially developed in the UK by Dr. Chris Williams, uh, who is a psychiatrist, and it was first adopted in CMHA uh, BC in 2008. Building on the success that uh, we had in CMHA BC, um, CMHA York and South Simcoe brought the program to Ontario as a pilot in 2015. In 2017, as part of the Government of Ontario's investment in publicly funded psychotherapy services, Bounce Back was then launched provincially across Ontario which is really great um, because during that time, we have had close to 13,000 uh, uh, family physicians, nurse practitioners, psychiatrists referring to the program. And we have had over 70,000 um, clients who have been referred into the Bounce Back program. And really exciting news that more recently, Bounce Back has uh, become part of the Ontario Structured Psychotherapy Program. And this is a step care program that provides evidence-based support to the people of Ontario who are experiencing uh, symptoms of depression, anxiety, and anxiety-related uh, disorders. So what type of uh, support uh, can Bounce Back offer? And there are two types. Uh, we have the telephone coaching and the, the workbooks. And for this type of support, a referral is required um, to access this part of the program. And we'll talk about how you can submit a referral. 
And we also have our Bounce Back Today online videos. Now there's no referral required uh, for this and clients can get started on this support right away. So now we'll talk a little bit about the role of the coach and exactly what your client um, will receive in Bounce Back. So Bounce Back clients receive telephone coaching support from coaches. Our coaches are not clinicians, so they're not able to provide the controlled active psychotherapy. Their role is to provide uh, your clients with educational and motivational support as they work through the program materials. So what does that look like exactly? Well, coaches will guide uh, your clients um, through the program materials by develop, helping them to develop new skills, helping them to problem solve or an answer any questions that they might have, and they monitor their, pro their progress over the uh, bounce back protocol. While coaches come from a very diverse uh, background, they do have one thing in common. And that's uh, all coaches receive an intensive training in the delivery of the bounce back program, the delivery of uh, cognitive behavioral therapy in the context of the bounce back program, and how to assess for suicidal risk along the way. Our coaches receive ongoing clinical oversight from a team of registered clinical psychologists, and they receive additional and as needed training in supporting um, other types of needs that might arise. So we have specialty training on uh, how to support our youth, helping people from different cultural backgrounds, different communities like uh, the two LGBTQ plus community and supporting clients during significant uh, life events. You know, so the pandemic that happened, um, returning to the office uh, from a pandemic our bounce, our bounce back coaches um, have regular contact and communication with their referrer, so the family physician or nurse practitioner, psychiatrist, and most often that comes at the point of entry into the program and completion, as well as um, when it's clinically indicated along the way. So moving along to what uh, are those program materials that we're talking about? So we uh, have uh, a number of, we have three uh, types of program materials. We have our long format workbooks, which are most frequently used in the program, the short format booklets and our youth booklets that are specifically uh, targeting our youth population. So with the help of their coach, your clients will decide on which program materials are a best uh, fit for them. All of our workbooks, whether it's the long format or short uh, booklets, are written at a grade four reading level. So they're really easy, easy to access um, by our clients. On this slide here, you see uh, a list of our 20 long format workbooks. These uh, 20 long format workbooks are divided into our core depression uh, module. We have a core anxiety module. Uh, and then we have optional workbooks um, that can be applied equally to both. Overall, these, um, these workbooks uh, cover uh, aspects of the cognitive behavioral model. So they target clients thinking as well as behaviors. The ones that are highlighted in uh, Aqua um, are the ones that have been particularly helpful to clients who have been experiencing chronic conditions such as cancer. So understanding low mood and depression um, are two workbooks that go uh, hand in hand, noticing uh, extreme and unhelpful thinking and then changing extreme and unhelpful thinking. In this uh, dyad, you uh, find out more about your patterns of unhelpful thinking and how to identify the ones that are particularly harmful to you. And then the second workbook to help you learn effective ways to challenge and overcome some of these unhelpful thinking patterns. Understanding worry is stress, facing fears and overcoming avoidance, as well as helpful things that you can do. On this next slide, um, you see a list of our short format uh, booklets. Uh, and these can also be available to our bounce back clients. So if a client is feeling overwhelmed or has a shorter attention span, um, the coach will uh, send or at least uh, provide this as an option for the client to have the shorter uh, format booklets. 
we want to draw your attention to this um, shorter format booklet that's called Reclaim Your Life. Um, and this booklet supports individuals who are dealing with significant health challenges. So it's intended for clients who are managing disability, chronic conditions or chronic pain, recurring illnesses. And the booklet provides concrete steps of what clients can do to, to feel better every day and to decrease the amount of their life that's taken up by their illness or their health condition. So you might be asking yourself or saying to yourself, this sounds too good to be true, is it? And the answer is yes, um, it is true. Um, we have evidence to back up our claims that Bounce Back is a wonderful program. Um, analyses of over 13,000 participants who have completed the program between uh, 2017 and 2022 uh, indicated significant improvements in symptoms of depression and anxiety. So specifically, uh, pre-post intervention analyses um, indicated that uh, there was a, a decrease of nearly in half of their anxious and depressive symptoms as measured by the uh, GAD-7 uh, and PHQ-9. Clients also reported significant improvements in their quality of life and physical health rating scores. And in addition, um, clients reported that their understanding of how their low mood and worry affects them, their knowledge of things that they can do to help themselves feel better, and their confidence in their ability to manage their mood or worry all substantially uh, increased uh, following completion of the bounce back program. So how do you refer? There are three main uh, pathways uh, for getting into our program. So first, as a primary care provider, you can submit a referral uh, directly uh, online from our website, or you can refer directly from your EMR or through Ocean e-referral network. Clients themselves can uh, refer directly by completing our online form on our website. At this time, we do ask for contact information for their family doctor or their nurse practitioner or psychiatrist so that we can contact them on their behalf and keep them updated on their progress. And uh, a third way of coming into our program is that any allied health professional, so a, a social worker, an occupational therapist, um, a psychotherapist can support uh, a client by completing an online referral form and submitting it on their behalf. Individuals can will be access. Uh, sorry, individuals will be called within five to ten business days, making bounce back a fast access uh, program for uh, clients. So now let's uh, take a look at someone who used the bounce back program and found, uh, found it helpful. So let's meet Sonia. Uh, she is a 51-year-old woman from Toronto who experienced challenges with managing her mood and chronic condition. As a result, she had symptoms of depression and anxiety, and she found it difficult to engage in, in activities, in her day-to-day -day activities, doing things for herself, something that was once really important to her. She also spent uh, the majority of her time supporting others and therefore often neglecting herself, which of course worsened her symptoms and left her feeling uh, fatigued and overwhelmed. So Sonia sought support from the Bounce Back program because she was feeling stressed out, she was feeling stuck, and she was wondering, when will I catch a break, right? When will I find time for myself? So how did uh, Bounce Back um, help? So, um, you know, happy to say that from the noticing and changing unhelpful thinking workbooks, Sonia learned how her thoughts about the world around her impact how she feels and how she responds to her health problems. Uh, using those two workbooks, she learned uh, skills to identify her unhelpful thought patterns and then different strategies for how to challenge them. And she noticed that, that when she did this, it had a positive influence uh, in terms of how she was feeling. And she was also better able to engage in those day-to-day -day activities. These uh, two workbooks also helped her to separate her thoughts of who she is as a person from the chronic condition that she has. With the Being Assertive workbook, uh, she learned how to set healthy boundaries with others by developing open and direct communication skills. 
And with the support of her coach, she started to stand up uh, to her family and started to feel less guilty prioritizing herself. This then in turn, uh, in turn allowed her to feel more empowered and less anxious. Uh, with a doing things that boost how you feel workbook, she learned skills for making structured plans so that she can engage in things that she was putting off and wanting to do for herself. And then with the support of her coach, Sonia learned how to pace herself, how to set specific goals based on what she can do now while being prepared to stop or rest as needed. The particular accomplishment that was a highlight for Sonia was being able to, um, to get back into her yoga practice and noticing how that small behavioral change really impacted and made a difference in terms of how she felt. For more information on the Bounce Back program, um, you can uh, download our patient handouts or, or, or for our patient handouts, you can visit our website at bouncebackontario.ca. Thank you. Thank you so much for all that great information about the Bounce Back program and all it offers. My name is Dr. Townsley and I'm gonna to speak to you about a study that we did looking specifically at cancer patients and how the bounce back program can be used. This was done in conjunction with the Peter Gilgan Center for Women's Cancers at Women's College Hospital. A diagnosis of cancer has a big impact on a patient's mental health. Uh, we can see that anxiety affects 18 to 20% of cancer survivors and risk factors for that include women, younger age at diagnosis, a shorter time since their diagnosis, living alone and having a higher number of comorbidities. Depression also affects a high percentage of cancer survivors, but fear of cancer recurrence affects a huge number of cancer survivors. Depending on the study, 50 to 80% of patients with a diagnosis of cancer will have some impact of fear of cancer recurrence on their life. Risk factors for this also include being female, under the age of 60, being socially isolated, an early time since their diagnosis, and having higher anxiety at baseline. And we also know that those who live with a higher fear of recurrence are more likely to engage in unhealthy behaviors, such as inactivity and smoking. Before I go into the details of our study, I wanna introduce you to our program. This is our team, and uh, we are the After Cancer Treatment Transition Program that's based at Women's College Hospital, and we provide cancer survivors with post-cancer care. We do the administration of endocrine therapy for our breast cancer survivors. We give information and management of post-treatment side effects. We do surveillance uh, for recurrence and any new cancers. We give ongoing emotional support and linkages both in our hospital and to resources in the community. And we facilitate their transition back to primary care. We currently see about 3000 cancer patients annually and approximately 70% of those are breast cancer survivors. And anxiety, depression and fear of cancer recurrence are major challenges for the patients that are in our program. Cognitive behavioral therapy itself has been found to be quite effective for anxiety and depression in general. And in cancer survivors, cognitive behavioral therapy can be effective at managing anxiety and depression. But to date, the research has been very limited on its effect in fear of cancer recurrence. Cognitive behavioral therapy includes a broad range of treatments that focus primarily on cognitive techniques that are used to change unhelpful thinking patterns or beliefs or attitudes that the patient may have that reinforce their ongoing uh, anxiety and depression. Guidelines from Cancer Care Ontario included addressing psychosocial needs of cancer survivors, and this became a priority. Traditionally, cognitive behavioral therapy is delivered through in-person sessions with either a therapist or a psychologist. But the need for more timely and widely accessible treatment options has prompted the introduction of virtual or web-based cognitive uh, behavioral therapy models. And Bounce Back is a great example of this. Given the large number of cancer survivors and their ongoing challenges with mental health, 
we wanted to examine the effects of depression, anxiety, and now as well, fear of cancer recurrence among cancer survivors who participated in a cognitive behavioral therapy based telephone coaching program, the Bounce Back program. And our study was recently published online in support of care in cancer. We got eligible patients from the uh, after cancer treatment transition clinic at Women's College Hospital, and then they were referred to the bounce back program. Eligible patients had to be 18 years of age or older, and they had to score uh, values on their PHQ-9 such that we were not worried that they needed um, very urgent psychiatric or other psychosocial help. They had to be capable engaging of the materials and the coaching that would be provided and be of no risk of harm to themselves or to others. There were a total of 44 participants that participated in the study. And the participation uh, involved completing a self-selected online workbooks, as well as support from the trained bounce back coaches, as you heard in the previous presentation. We did measures of depression, anxiety, and fear of cancer recurrence, and we collected them at baseline and at post-intervention at six and 12 month time points. Participant experiences and perceptions were collected as well through a survey where they could express um, aspects of the coaching that they felt were good or not as good. These are our initial results. So the measures of depression and anxiety significantly improved among participants from baseline to post-intervention, both at six month and the 12 month mark from uh, levels of moderate um, anxiety and depression to mild. And interestingly, the symptoms did not appear to worsen well after the intervention was completed as the measures remained consistent at the post-intervention time points of both six and 12 months. And the measure of fear of cancer recurrence also significantly improved. And this was very interesting because we had not looked at this um, fear of cancer recurrence endpoint as much in the literature previous to this study. As well, participants rated the intervention a mean score of seven out of 10, indicating a moderate level of satisfaction and usefulness. Generally, participants who had positive experience in the program and coached, coaching reported feeling more motivated to develop new skills and strategies to help with their depression and anxiety. They realized the impact of their thoughts and emotions on their body. However, there were some participants that experienced challenges or limitations with the phone coaching and wanted it less scripted. These are just a bit more of our results expanded a bit. The fear of cancer recurrence measure can actually be divided into seven subscales, which characterize the fear of cancer recurrence. And five of the, sub, of the seven subscale scores actually improved significantly after the intervention, suggesting a decrease in their effect. For example, triggers that prompt a higher fear of cancer recurrence, the severity of the cancer recur of fear itself, the psychosocial distress that the patient experienced, their actual functional impairment on their day-to-day -day life, and their overall insight into their fear of cancer recurrence all improved from baseline to post-intervention and remained quite consistent even at the 12-month mark. So in summary, this study focused on whether a program like Bounce Back can help address the psychosocial needs of cancer survivors and provide support for individuals to self-manage anxiety, depression, and fear of cancer recurrence. Our findings, although preliminary, were very encouraging since measures of depression, anxiety, and fear improved from pre to post intervention. And it was also reassuring that psychosocial symptoms did not appear to worsen even well after the intervention was completed, suggesting that this impact may be sustainable and that patients may be able to use, use these tools as they travel down the journey of their cancer survivorship. Although depression and anxiety have been shown to improve on their own over time, previous studies and our current studies suggest that this intervention will be worthwhile, especially one that involves both self-learning materials and professional support, and as it seems to be um, sustainable over time. 
The bounce back workbooks that were most commonly used by the participants, participants in this study included changing extreme and unhelpful thinking, understanding worry and stress, facing fears and overcoming avoidance, helpful things that you can do, and planning for your future. Uh, in conclusion, the study suggests that a virtual cognitive behavioral therapy-based telephone coaching program is an effective approach to managing depression, anxiety, and fear of cancer recurrence in cancer survivors. I have put together um, some selected references that will be included in the slide deck if you're interested in any more information about um, anxiety and depression and fear of cancer recurrence in cancer survivors and cognitive behavioral therapy. And I thank you for your attention. And now I'll pass it over to Dr. Ginty, who's gonna to talk to you about some tools and coaching tips developed by the Canadian Partnership Against Cancer. Thank you so much. So I'm uh, presenting a, a toolkit that we developed. And this was um, a, a really interesting study. We, uh, I was asked to do a presentation for the adults and uh, uh, young adolescents and young adults. Uh, uh, it was a forum. And I felt that this was a unique um, uh, population and that in fact, I wanted to learn more about what they needed uh, rather than present for them. And so what we did, we was we designed a survey when they registered that would help us uh, help educate primary care to um, understand what was most needed by this population. And it triggered a, an educational um, uh, toolkit for family physicians and primary care and health providers in any, in any um, area. They may even be the, the nurse who is uh, with them at chemo. It may be, um, it may be somebody who is uh, assisting the oncologist. It could be any healthcare provider who can actually use some of these uh, tools that the uh, adolescents and young adults have actually voiced to us that they want. And I think that's the most powerful piece of this. And this is uh, a, uh, the toolkit in summary which is so fantastic and it's very easy to walk through. Now I'm going to walk you through the six main categories that we have. So here's, a, here's my coaching tips. And I come as a, uh, a, a BRCA carrier and a younger uh, adult um, cancer survivor. Um, and I think this is different population than an older, um, uh, uh, cancer survivors because these people have a life ahead and they're going back to work. And so, um, next slide, please. So we came up with the first one. So the, this was loud and clear, loud and clear on the survey. Uh, listen and be proactive. Now I say, listen and be validating. What I mean by validating is uh, when they voice distress, when they see you at any point, um, well, I'm upset, I'm, I'm tired. Um, uh, instead of saying, what can I do about it? You say, that must, be, that must be hard being tired all the time. And this is validation. And it's remarkably, um, uh, it's remarkably powerful to use this in conversation. And the other piece that you can use is when someone says, uh, I, I, I feel tired, um, you can use that word to, to trigger more. What does tiredness feel like to you? And, and so that keeps using words that are using their voice to uh, further a conversation. Um, well, you know, I'm tired that I, I need to get a job and, I, um, and so on. What kind of job do you want to get? So you keep using, that's a, a validation. And then this is the, the method of um, continuing to show that you're in an active listening mode. Um, so there's, there's that active listening where you are listening, but you're, you're, you're echoing their words and moving the conversation forward uh, in, in their manner. So this was very loud and clear that, uh, health providers need to listen and validate 
the the dis the stresses that these people a unique population that apply to all cancer patients that they're going through. So the next one is to um, ask about their mental health, make connections. Um, this is uh, about support, um, and you can certainly ask them. So how are you feeling today? Uh, what's your mood been feeling like? Um, and quite honestly, it is really nice to connect with uh, resources to help with your mental health. But they actually have been so fragile that that even um, uh, even disclosing to you that day that they're feeling depressed may be the first time they've actually even said that word. So then saying, oh, I'll find you some resources might not be the time. You might have to see them a couple of times before uh, they're ready to go to someone else. Saying, you know, that's really powerful that you've told me that you're depressed. I'm with you today and I want to hear more about this. Can we set up another appointment? Or can you tell me more about this? It's they, they, have, they have disclosed something very personal to them. And it's our job to hold that and not just take it and pass it on. So they do need resources, yes, but they have also they also are desperate to hold on to someone. And if that's a primary care provider, they have now just disclosed to you that uh, that this is a, a very fragile part of their mental health, that instead of being strong, because everyone says they're strong and then they go through cancer and they will beat it. Uh, they have disclosed to you that they're not doing very well and they're fragile and they may have um, uh, anxiety or depression. And this is actually more of a difficulty than you think. They need to find the right person and you need to um, hold it and say, I can hold this with you. I have, I have your back and I'm gonna be here and we can make another appointment. And that's, that's that, um, that's what they need, that, that life ring in a time when uh, it feels really fragile. Next slide, please. Um, uh, the physical side, Th these are the physical effects. And we call them physical, but are they really physical when you talk about brain fog? You know, um, I always think of things like um, fatigue, neuropathy, uh, where uh, it's difficult now to hold things, uh, where they may have been in a job where that was actually quite a necessity, perhaps, you know, if they are dealing with money or dental equipment or or uh, counting things, where they're not feeling so, so much, or that it's painful. Um, uh, sometimes it affects the neuropathy, affects their hearing, which these days wearing masks can be pretty uh, difficult actually to, uh, to, to manage that. Or people on uh, phone calls uh, all the time. It's actually quite difficult when you've had uh, neuropathy with your hearing with some of the um, uh, chemotherapy regimens. The fatigue we all know is, can be up to lifelong, that you're never the same. So uh, do, do your work colleagues uh, realize this? Do they uh, make accommodations? Very difficult. And this is, these are people who uh, do not want to be um, uh, trying to get a job with accommodations. They may, they may be getting a job for the first time. So uh, this, this is very uh, difficult for them financially as well that they have to uh, maximize their time. So perhaps ways that they can improve their, um, uh, their fitness, for example, doing activity that's uh, outside of their work, uh, like having a regular um, uh, gym class or something like that. We know actually getting active improves, uh, improves fatigue remarkably. Um, brain fog is, or we call it um, cancer-related cognitive impairment now. Uh, and that this is uh, very real. Uh, we do know that it, uh, it ages you by about 10 years uh, to go through chemotherapy and uh, it, it's never quite the same. But understanding that for yourself, writing things down, finding jobs where you can work uh, and take breaks, uh, where, uh, where you can find ways of, of managing. It really is about managing this. It does improve, but it is, cognitively tiring. Um, so uh, th 
understanding this for themselves more than anything is is and and having self compassion which is where we can come in to validate that self compassion that they need to have for for these things that they are real they're not imagining them so next slide please now return to work a very a very difficult thing um return to work or school especially in adults and young ad young adult uh, cancers um it's it's difficult to reintegrate uh, back to uh, back to work or back to school at a pace that's expected. Um, there's there's to some extent some accommodation, um, but I do encourage people to uh, to be authentic, uh, to disclose uh, perhaps that they have uh, been through some difficult disease. Um, uh, experience and uh, to work through, uh, take the time to work through their loss uh, and grieve their loss um, before they uh, attempt to get into full-time work, full-time um, school, just because I think that it can carry some of the anger, anxiety, depression with it until you're ready to um, uh, uh, move in a, in a direction that um, uh, that has a, 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 a good, a, that moving in, in, a, in a direction that has it as a positive experience, let's say. I don't think you ever get past it. I'm going to say that you live with it. Uh, I always say that you live with it on your shoulder instead of right in front of you. So I like to think that you live with it on your shoulder. Okay, next, next slide, please. Now, this is one of my big passions. As you know, I assist in, in breast reconstruction surgery, and uh, it's the second most distressing symptom in, um, in cancer, uh, whether it be uh, the breast or whether it be a uh, colon, uh, a, a colon um, uh, uh, appliance uh, that they, they have to wear, um, where, uh, whether, whether they have um, uh, uh, hair loss, um, whether they have uh, some head, ma mouth, mouth and head and neck cancers have uh, difficulty with uh, speech and, uh, the, and even eating, which is a very social thing. So some of these uh, cancers have major body image and sexual function loss. Um, and this needs to be talked about. It, it just this needs to be talked about. Period. And if you feel that the the that you you as a primary care provider don't have the ability to talk about it, you do need to find someone who validates that ability. I do think that everyone should be talking about it, but we all know that ninety eight percent of people know they should talk about it, and two percent do, because. I think a lot of the times that we don't bring something up if we feel we can't, um, uh, if we feel we can't talk about it. it. If it's awkward for us to talk about, if we don't bring it up, it's not there. But loud and clear, adolescents and young adults make this very well known that this is a very prominent feature. And as I just illustrated, it's across the board. A lot of cancer treatments, for survival require quite disfiguring surgery uh, and uh, side effects of chemotherapy. And sometimes some of those even are lymphedema and wearing lymphedema appliances. So uh, when you have to have some dissections, which can happen with young melanoma patients, uh, for example. So um, the other thing don't forget is that in a younger population, you're also going to worry about um, their uh, fertility and reproduction. So uh, this is, this is a, something that a fertility uh, clinic is actually well aware of and freezing eggs is part of the um, cancer um, planning. But uh, some of the time it, uh, it actually requires that the uterus will be in the field of red, rate of uh, radiation or the ovaries will be in the field of radiation. And so they couldn't, can't actually ever um, have uh, children themselves if it's not um, a surrogate. So 
these are grief and losses that need to be validated and talked about. They're, they're not all solvable solutions. You need to be in their, in their loss with them. Uh, and you won't need to solve this. It's just being there with them on the journey. Um, next slide, please. So the other thing, of course, in the cancer journey is uh, fear of recurrence and, um, and uh, further screening. This might be further screening for their disease, um, uh, which, which, is, which will have a survivorship um, uh, care plan, uh, which you should be aware of, which is usually shared if there's a, a discharge plan. Um, because these patients will at some point in their survivorship be discharged from the cancer center. And that in itself is a very alarming and fearful time for them because it's really being released from the arms of what uh, was felt to be the people who saved you. So in a mental health perspective, this is actually a very um, worrisome time. You'll also remember that everyone has a fear of uh, follow-up CTs, so they have a, a lot of anxiety before the CT scans, and validating that and helping them through um, uh, whether they need anything, anything medicational for uh, managing that is also helpful. And uh, the then there's specific um, uh, risks that may be uh, related to some of the radiation they've had. If they had uh, 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 chest radiation, they will be at higher risk. They would actually be classed as high risk uh, for breast cancer. Uh, so these are some of the um, more specific uh, to their treatment, and they would require uh, assessment in a high risk uh, breast screening program. Um, and then we also get into the just uh, other screening. So these people may may have um, uh, the usual screening, cervical, colon, um, and and breast uh, screening, like all adults. Um, but also, don't forget that radiation skin has a slightly higher risk of um, routine skin cancers as well. So in your office, just making sure that they have. Uh, this sort of thing is, is helpful. If they're in uh, long-term chemotherapy, they're deemed to be immunosuppressed, and this opens another whole set of um, uh, screening, uh, which makes them a high-risk uh, cervical cancer. So the screening is, uh, is, is important. We have a fabulous uh, video that we made at, out of all this information for you, and I think it's really helpful. It's on YouTube. Um, but I think what I, uh, I hope that what I've talked to you about with my, with a great passion has triggered uh, just a, a sharing of information and how important it is to validate and just be with the person on their cancer journey. And these are some of the uh, resources we have. Thank you, Dr. Ginty, and hello, everyone. It's such a pleasure to speak with you today. So much of what we've heard really validates the importance of patients being connected to the support and information they need while they're receiving medical care. I'm excited to share with you what people living with cancer are telling us and how we can work together to ensure we are receiving, that patients are receiving the information and support they need in a way that's meaningful to them. Next slide, please. At the Canadian Cancer Society, our mission is to improve the lives of all those affected by cancer through world-class research, advocacy, and compassionate support. And we provide that compassionate support through the provision of information and support services. Next slide, please. The Canadian Cancer Society is the only national charity that supports Canadians coast to coast with all cancers in communities across the country. There's a large and growing body of evidence that demonstrates the positive impact that information and support programs can have on a person's overall quality of life and those of their caregivers. However, despite the best efforts of the cancer system, patients continue to report that their information and support needs remain largely unmet. 
Through our programs, we help people manage life with cancer, find community and connection, and build resil resilience. Next slide, please. Since March 2020, Canada's healthcare systems have adapted and evolved at an unprecedented rate to respond to COVID-19. We continue to hear from people affected by cancer who say they are frustrated by a lack of access to their healthcare teams and that they believe that they're collateral damage of the COVID-19 pandemic. At various points throughout the pandemic, the Canadian Cancer Society administered five patient engagement surveys to understand the impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic on people affected by cancer. The survey provided important insights that I will highlight for you now. Firstly, parents and caregivers, both patients and caregivers both reported an increased level of anxiety and concern about receiving appropriate cancer care. They talked about disruptions in cancer care and other services, the greatest disruptions associated with patients' interactions with their doctors, followed by other cancer services and treatment. They identified increase in the levels of caregiver support, half the caregiver respondents reporting that they've had to provide more support than usual. They told us very clearly that there's been an impact on the physical and mental health of patients and care caregivers, many reporting that they felt more anxious or nervous than normal. Disruptions to cancer services has resulted in a backlog that will likely take years to address. So in this time of pandemic recovery, what is the best response? One of the things that the pandemic has taught us is the importance of leveraging digital health tools to offer secure and more complete way of referring patients to the resources that they need. Expanding scope of practice to embed digital referrals into current EMRs is a way you can ensure patients are being directed to the information and supports they need and helps create efficiencies for healthcare providers. Next slide, please. In 2020, with funding from the Canadian Partnership Against Cancer, we started a two-year project titled Supporting Navigation from the Community. This project aimed to help Canadians with cancer as they transition from cancer care to primary care by improving their ability to access key information and support resources. We know that within the cancer patient journey, there are two main transition points where referrals to the CCS would provide the most support and offer the most opportunity and they are the time leading to diagnosis and entering the cancer system, and when patients leave cancer care and transition back into primary care. Both transition times are times of high distress with limited resource availability. In our early days in this project, we fo focused our attention on Atlantic Canada, where the pandemic had not impacted the healthcare system to the same degree as, as in other jurisdictions. Healthcare providers reported that as the pandemic ramped up, that providing individual support and consultations with their patients was one of the many things that fell to the wayside. Staff dedicated to providing this support were being redeployed to manage the demands of the pandemic. Having a seamless way of referring their patients to the Canadian Cancer Society, let them focus on the tasks at hand while knowing that their patients were being well supported. The Canadian Cancer Society is currently developing a digital transformation strategy to move this process from secure facts to fully integrated e-referral solution. We are having ongoing conversations with eHealth Ontario to explore Ocean as a possible solution. The Cancer Information Helpline is a core mission program and the receiving end of CCS's public facing 1888 number. It is often the gateway into the Canadian Cancer Society and provides clients with the information and support services they are seeking. In our last fiscal, the Cancer Information Helpline responded to 44,000 inquiries. It is staffed by a team of professionals who support clients with their questions about cancer or cancer prevention. The knowledge base spans the trajectory of the cancer continuum from pre-diagnosis to prevention all the way through treatment and di diagnosis and treatment and survivorship and end-of-life care, as well as the entire psychosocial arena, including informational, emotional, physical, and practical topics. Our information, pardon me, our information specialists support clients in both official languages, and we have access to an on-demand interpreter service that can provide translation in up to 200 other languages. Our information specialists are equal measure experts in information management and supportive care, we spend as much time providing holistic care that 
explores their broader cancer story while also ensuring we answer the specific questions that compel them to reach out to us. Our scope of practice is general information, never prescriptive. We do not diagnose, nor do we make recommendations for any particular treatment or medical intervention. In those circumstances, we support the therapeutic relationship by providing general information about cancer or cancer treatment and help our clients form questions that they can take back to their medical providers for the prescriptive inputs they are seeking. We do not have call quotas or limits on call lengths. We spend as much time with each person as needed to provide an informative, but also a compassionate and unrushed conversation. Clients who have used the Cancer Information Helpline have reported that um, has resulted in better communication with their healthcare providers, reduce their anxiety, and increase their ability to cope with the emotional, practical, and physical impacts of a cancer diagnosis. One of the resources that our helpline team uses is our directory of services, the Community Services Locator. This is an online searchable database that houses more than 4,500 cancer related services. The CSL is a resource for cancer patients, caregivers, and healthcare professionals to find the services they need locally or online. Through this service, everyone can access uh, CCS's programs and services, but also many other resources across Canada for those living with cancer. Cancer.ca houses a complete listing of our suite of information and support programs. I wanted to highlight this booklet that helps patients keep track of important information, such as test results, treatment cycles, and side effects to report. It also suggests some questions to ask their healthcare team. It provides space for patients to document their questions prior to seeing their healthcare provider and also record the answers they receive. CIH agents regularly provide this resource to their clients to help support the clinical therapeutic relationship. Visiting cancer.ca will provide you and your patients with information about cancer, where to access support in the community, and a full suite of our programs and services. You will also find the healthcare care provider referral form where you can re refer your patients to the Cancer Information Helpline and an information specialist can help them connect to the supports that they need. You will also find the live chat button to connect with an information specialist in real time. My contact information is included in your package and I would love to have further discussions with anyone who is interested in learning more about how we can help improve the clinical and patient experience through our referral process. Thank you. Well, thank you so much to Joanne and to all of our presenters. We have run out of time for Q&A, um, but I hope you will agree that uh, giving all of our speakers enough time uh, to introduce you to this content and review these resources has been um, incredibly um, valuable. Um, in closing, thank you so much uh, for attending. We hope you found this information useful. We'll be sending a recording of today's presentation to everyone who registered along with a PDF of the presentation. As part of our follow-up, we'll also share our resource guide that summarizes the information we covered today from all of our partner organization. So you can use it as a quick reference guide. It will be available in English and French to you. It'll also include contact information uh, should you want to get in touch uh, with any of the organizations that are part of today's webinar. Thank you all so much once again for joining and have a great day.